Okay, moving on to the next session, um, which is also on business transformation. Uh, we'll be targeting the banking sector, but I want to ask a question first. How many in this room use digital banking? No, oh, that's a lot. <laughs> okay, so according to an ArabNet study that um, on actually digital banking adaptation, 74% of the banking clients in the UAE are digital adapters. So let me welcome our regional MD and the moderator of this panel who will dig deeper into this subject. Ladies and gentlemen, one of my personal role models, Mr. Tarek Da'ou. That's a big role today. Uh, so thank you everyone for joining this session. Uh, it's one of my favorite sessions. I'm honored to moderate it because it covers an industry that's probably, as you experience, is completely disrupted by, by technology, which is the fintech industry. Uh, a lot of the products, services, workflows, processes that were once done by paper money or by human interaction can now be probably done more and more by smarter digital interfaces. Um, there's a massive opportunity for startups in this area and we'll talk about it uh, today because these startups are reimagining every single service in the financial industry. So does this represent a threat or an opportunity for the established businesses? Uh, for this, I'm uh, happy to introduce you to two key experts, our esteemed speakers, uh, Vikram Krishna, the head of marketing and customer experience for Emirates NBD. Please join us on stage. <laughs> and uh, Paul Tomala, SVP Global Corporate Relations and Development for ACI. So thank you very much for joining us today. As well said, around three quarters of the bank clients in the UAE adopt digital banking, but still almost half of them still go to the, to the branch, wherever in the, in the UAE. So I'd like to get your thoughts about three aspects uh, today. One is trust, second is customer experience, and third is brands and, and differentiation. So let's start with the, with the first one. For those who are still going to the, to the branches, right? And those big businesses, small businesses, individual clients who are used to a relationship with the bank. Do you think technology has evolved enough to allow them to trust the relationship with the bank through a digital interface? Do you think a smart algorithm could probably replace a lot of relationship managers, could make the relationship more personal, more smarter as it goes. How does it go for, for your business, Vikram? So, uh, great question, uh, Tariq. Uh, we, we, we basically seen in our line of work, uh, you know, two clear areas uh, emerging from the context of uh, digitization. I think the first is the world of transactions, and second is the world of advice. So uh, advice is all the value-added services you get from a bank in terms of you know, your, uh, uh, your lifestyle, your wealth management uh, uh, discussions, uh, your, your mortgages and some of the other lending products that you typically access. Uh, the, the world of transactions is about cash and you know, taking cash out of the bank, the branch, the ATM, etc. So we clearly see uh, that the world of transactions is getting more and more digitized. And a lot of the payments that uh, were uh, made through physical transactions at the branch or you know, through the channels that we, that we keep, uh, I, I think that's an area where we're seeing a lot of change. Uh, but I still believe that uh, there's a big role that uh, people like us, human beings, have to play uh, in terms of interacting with customers, understanding what their needs are, uh, understanding the expectations and then uh, structuring banking and financial solutions. So for that, those interactions continue, right? But uh, from a digitization context, what we're doing is that we are uh, equipping bankers with more and more information uh, that can help uh, extending solutions to clients as they interact with us. So, you know, uh, uh, understanding exactly 
you know, how he banks with us, what products has he or she taken up, uh, what could be the next best product that, that can be extended. So a whole of, lot of that information uh, is something that uh, we're equipping our frontline staff with so that when customers actually interact with that staff, uh, they can dip onto that information and give a finer advice as compared to what they're doing at this point in time. And uh, how do you go about understanding them? Do you rely on uh, different analytics models or do you rely on relationships? Uh, so I think it's a combination of both. If you equip uh, relationships with analytics, I think that's really where the, the magic quadrant really lies. So uh, banks obviously uh, have access to a whole lot of personal uh, information. Um, and I think that we're able to then leverage to a, to a fairly elaborate uh, uh, analytic setup uh, that we, that we uh, as banks uh, represent. And that's more to do with the fact that, you know, how can we make banking simpler? How can we make things more convenient? How can we make banking a lot more intuitive? Uh, and that's where uh, technologies like CRM systems, uh, Analytic solutions, which uh, encompass uh, the, cur the current favorite buzzword, big data. Uh, it, you know, it, it's more about uh, structuring, aggregating um, uh, data that's available in a, in a manner and form that's uh, easy for not just the customer, but for the banks to consume as well so that they can extend solutions. So it's a fairly sophisticated framework that we are constantly evolving. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's what we do to make, make it uh, easier for people. Paul, on the same subject of trust, probably for the past few years at Arabnet, whenever we talk about uh, e-commerce, we still talk about cash on, on demand and uh, uh, digital payment and trust issues, sometimes accessibility, sometimes uh, uh, trust. Um, you work in different parts of the world. Do mm -hmm. you think this is a barrier that could be overcome? How did you experience it in other countries? What do you forecast for the region? I think, <clears throat> I think that depending on where you are in the world, it's very different. Um, if you are in Holland, for instance, um, there is absolute trust in the systems. In fact, nearly all the traffic goes through um, e-routes. If you're in the US, um, it's kind of mixed, uh, but the younger generation is clearly uh, doing things more around the banks as well as with the banks. And it really does depend on which, which part of the world that you are in. And I think one of the things that um, you, is really hard to get your brains around at times is different regions around the world have very different needs and interests. So, you know, I come from the UK, as you probably, probably gathered by, my, by, <coughs> by the way I speak. But um, you know, we have one of the oldest, oldest clearing systems in the world. And that was based upon uh, a five-day settlement period. And the five-day settlement period was based upon how long it would take a fast horse to go from the north of the country to London. That's no way to run a banking infrastructure. And I think that while that has trust in one way, it doesn't have trust in a digital way. Still. Uh, roughly speaking, 67% of all the banks in Europe, because we did a survey last year, said, yeah, I trust the banks to do this. So it kind of does depend. And I think that there is a high dependency on cash and high dependency on branch. Uh, but I think both of those mm -hmm. tend to a lack of understanding. When you, you know, when I was certainly was growing up, you went to the branch and you asked the person uh, behind the till, to help you do whatever it was that you wanted to do. Well, I, I don't necessarily need that type of expertise anymore. I need a different set of expertise. And the thing with cash is you don't have to worry about it. You just, you know, do it. But how long will that be before that model really doesn't exist? You see the US and you see China and you see certainly the U, uh, sorry, sorry, the EU is saying we will actively take away cash. In, in, in the Nordics, they are reducing the number of ATMs 10% year on year on year. And the reason for that is to make it harder to get cash out of the system. Why? Because it drives the dark economy. And the dark economy is a, is a problem, whether we like it or not, around the world. So, you know, getting, to be, getting this trust piece fixed it's really, really important, and it does 
play to the digital needs of what we need to get done. And I believe in this region, you probably have the best opportunity to move a lot more quickly, frankly, because you don't have the history. You don't have the, you know, 150 years um, worth of um, archaic systems that we have in the UK, for instance. So I think you can move a lot more quickly and I think dominate a region. Which brings us to the interesting discussion around cash and around startups and um, I'm sure you'll find today a lot of interesting startups try to get a piece of the, of the business. So the, as per our discussion b before the panel, still around 80% of all everyday spend across MENA is still in cash. So that's a lot of money, a lot of transaction, right? And everyone is trying to get a piece of it. Now, the startups are known to focus more on creating great customer experience that probably the big legacy businesses haven't created uh, yet. And they're trying also the, the big businesses to see how you deal with all the frictions of, of innovation. What role do you think startups in MENA can play? Can they do it? Will they do it? Have you seen any interesting startups in the region playing this role? If not, have you seen anything uh, globally? If not, what area do you wish these startups to focus on? Yeah, so a couple of interesting ones. Uh, I've, I know Lending Club has, been, has come under a bit of cloud right now, but I think uh, uh, Lending Club started a very interesting space, which is the whole peer-to-peer -peer lending business and we're seeing a bit of that in the region as well so I think uh, if I'm not mistaken Beehive is, yep. is really the first uh, in that space. I find what they're doing interesting and I'm closely watching to see uh, the difference that, that it can make. Uh, second we are fascinated with what blockchain is doing and uh, we're trying to see um, how we can use blockchain to uh, transfer money into different parts of the world faster and more efficiently for our customers. And I'm actually really excited with that technology. We're doing a few experiments ourselves. Um, so yeah, so I think in the banking and financial services space, those are two that uh, immediately uh, come to my mind. Uh, otherwise, I think uh, some of the startups in the recent times, I love Uber, I love Airbnb. Um, I, I quite uh, appreciate the work that Kareem's doing in this market as well. Yeah. And they've added their own little dimension uh, to the entire user experience, which I think is quite fascinating. So there's lots going on. Uh, it keeps uh, us bankers extremely busy uh, because the kind of constraints that we face, the startups don't. Uh, <coughs> we also have this huge legacy of trust that we need to make sure that uh, we maintain in every decision that we take. So banks tend to hesitate getting into some of these areas because you want to make sure that the plumbing is right. Because if the plumbing is not right, then, you know, money changes yeah. hands uh, in a manner that can seriously uh, impair uh, you know, some of the credibilities that, that we represent. Mm -hmm. So yeah, interesting work happening. Uh, it inspires us to do a lot more every day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, keeping a close track. Yeah, I, I mean, I think. Well, but just, just a question sorry. to you on, on this. Do you think startups in the FinTech industry, are they a threat or an opportunity for banks? So uh, if I may continue with that, yeah, please so, go ahead. so uh, uh, we just concluded our FinTech challenge. We had 200 plus startups from across the world that took part in it. And uh, we were adopting a lot of thinking and mindsets that they, uh, that they represent. Um, so it's, we've started that journey uh, yeah. and, and uh, we, we're closely looking at adopting a few of those ideas into our business. Right. Okay. So I mean, I think that it's, um, it's a very interesting discussion once, once one gets into FinTech. A couple of things I'd point out. Um, you know, I when I'm old enough and boring enough to be around when, when the internet was gonna be big. In fact, IBM said to me, hey Paul, go spend a year and work out what, the, what, what this means um, to us. So I was, in, I was in a think tank for a long time thinking about it. And at the time, a lot of the rhetoric that was used was around disintermediation. Um, you know, whole bunch of disruption, things are gonna happen. And it was all about uh, retailers, it was about insurance, and it was about banks and travel. Well, you know, by and large, uh, banks are still around, uh, retailers are still around, uh, insurers are still around, 
travel industry, I grant you, has changed. But essentially, what's happened is people uh, in those industries have taken the technology and adopted it and brought it inside. And I think if you think back to that time, there's a lot of people focusing on the tech, what the tech can do. Now, on the internet side, that's relatively easy to do. Once you've got a good technical grasp of how the protocols work, you can move forward. Unfortunately, banking and, you know, uh, <coughs> excuse me, and core payments just isn't quite that simple. And the problem with fintech, as I see it, it's mostly about the tech and less about the fin. And the problem with that is, if you don't understand how money gets moved from A to B and um, the needs that that drives in terms of scalability, availability and trust, then yeah, you might have a very cool app, but it doesn't mean jack. And that's the problem that I see at the moment. Too much, too much of a spread bet from VC saying, oh, you know, here's a million, here's a million, here's a million, you know, we'll see what happens. Whereas what I suspect will happen is they will bring ideas, and those ideas, um, which won't be owned by any IP rights, will be adopted, and the banks will take them in, and some of those firms will be bought and brought into the banking infrastructure. So I'm kind of a little bit more cynical than I was uh, last year, was I thought some of the fintechs would really get it. But uh, I'm afraid... <coughs> There isn't enough understanding of uh, the actual industry and the way it works. And don't forget, you know, when it's money, there are rules. There are hardcore, you know, <coughs> regulatory issues. This isn't a bit of tech you can put on an app and say, hey, let's go move, you know, a billion euros around. It doesn't work like that. So... You, you know, the whole balance here around the fintech is a, is, is a little out of kilter. And I suspect it will be um, a bunch of ex-bankers becoming um, non-execs on fintech's boards that will bring that into the industry when we see the next generation of fintechs that will really understand what they can bring, but also what they're playing against. And I think that's a very difficult uh, job to get done. And it's interesting, we're, we're talking about the regulation. We had an interesting discussion about the role of government in this, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, if we look at the, at the region, there are two big challenges with cash. A lot of, big part of the population is unbanked, yeah. right? Especially in, in countries outside the, the UAE. And a lot of the trade structure, I know we had some big uh, modern trade as, as guests, but we have to look at Saudi Arabia, a lot of the trade is still happening in the modern ones, in the bakalas, right? These don't have access to payment solutions. Uh, Vikram, we're also discussing an interesting concept, what's happening in India and what Dubai Smart Government is, is doing. So if you look at these unbanked uh, cash paying uh, customers, where do you see the opportunity over there? And who do you think are the players who will jump? Are you guys? Banks? <laughs> is it the government? Of course are they it's telcos? <laughs> I don't know if we have to do under this a lot with us. Yeah. Are, there, are there startups that will, will get into there before you guys? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a trillion dollar question, yeah. right? if not more. Um, so uh, I, I think the moot point is that uh, for the global economy, cash is not efficient. And fundamentally, cash needs to move into um, electronic payment mechanisms for, for more reasons than one, and I don't think I need to elaborate on that. Um, I think the, the uh, opportunity lies in uh, removing the friction that the industry currently experiences, and that adds to cost, that adds to accessibility issues. And in that, uh, I think it's the e whole ecosystem where it's not just the banks, but it's not just the central bank, it's also the government institutions that have a big role to play in, you know, in connecting all of this uh, together. So uh, I, I was mentioning to uh, Tariq as an example, uh, many countries have this unique identification number. So uh, when you combine a unique identification number with a bank account, then transformation occurs. So we're seeing that now in many countries across the world. So a recent one is uh, 
in India, where almost a billion people have access to that UID number. So when you connect UID with uh, bank accounts, suddenly payments for uh, subsidies, uh, payments for you know, work that you're doing, payments for taxation, etc., get seamlessly extended without the intermediaries in between uh, who are a part of it. So I think uh, the writing on the, wall, on the wall is quite clear that in the current environment uh, with banks and fintechs and payment organizations, I think there's a whole lot of incremental change that can come in, and that's what we've been seeing for the last two decades. But for true transformation to uh, be extended, I think it's very important that all the partners involved in this, including governments, get involved. And if that happens, then uh, I think we should see uh, during our lifetime the end of cash, hopefully. Paul? I think the journey of cash is very different around the world. I was speaking in the US um, a couple of months ago and I gave the analogy because the US is, you know, frankly, you know, quite a way behind here. Um, but if you think about it and the journey, it wasn't, wasn't that long ago that we used to open up our wallets and give money, then we started to, you know, write checks and then we, you know, got cards and we swiped the cards and now we insert cards and we tap cards. And the point is, at the end of the day, the end user doesn't want to be involved in any of that. They want it to be in context. They don't necessarily have to do anything. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, I must make a payment today. No, you don't, dear. And I, I think that's the issue. The issue at hand is that there is still friction. And we have to take that friction out of the system to make it better and easier. But the other side of it is we also have to take out the layers. Um, so I do believe this is you know, a governmental-based issue, and I, I wouldn't want to see Apple become the Uber, uh, the, the larger identity brand. I wouldn't want to see Samsung become that. I think that's a governmental-based issue. I don't think you want to outsource ID to a commercial organization. On the other hand, if you think about the layers that go between a, um, a uh, in-store transaction right now, they go from the store systems to the network to the, to, the, to the PSP, to the acquiring bank, to the owning bank, blah, 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 blah. Every one of those layers takes money out of the system. And actually, roughly speaking, that's about, that is about 3% of the actual transaction gets wasted in these intermediates. But not only that, it's all the point where a bad guy can come in and try and hack it. It also brings the friction in. Why do you do it like this? Why do you do it like this? Because these are a MasterCard say we must, um, and so on and so forth. The problem with that is friction, and I think the opportunity here is to cut out, frankly, a lot of the middlemen, and for the bank's brands really to come back to the fore, hopefully with a governmental-based ID that unifies the rails by which we can go back. Whether it's, frankly, SWIFT or it's the current network providers, Visa, MasterCard, etc. They are fixing an old problem that we had when it was about standardization of an address or standardization of a card. By now, we know where everybody is in the world. We don't need that. We don't need those costs, and we don't need that friction. I think the opportunity that we're seeing with the immediate payment rails takes away a lot of that and will make the actual end user experience a lot slicker and take away a lot of the friction and that's a great opportunity. But I do believe it has to be governmental based ID. Yeah. So, so talking about eliminating friction, Vikram with the smart government initiative in, in Dubai, have you seen any specific actions that could help you take away this friction, at least from your part of the business? No, I think there's some fascinating work that uh, the government is doing. I think there's some terrific work that we're seeing from uh, RTA, there's some really impressive work that we're seeing from uh, the customs and immigration. Um, I, I think the, the, the <coughs> mindset so far has been really from, from controlling uh, acts of citizenship and people coming and going out of the country. 
I think the next sort of frontier is to how do you link that to commerce? And uh, how do you help uh, the banking and, and financial services, the merchants, uh, how do you link that whole piece up and help in using that information we've already collected to create commercial opportunities? So, so for example, the immigration already has our retina scan, um, they already have our uh, fingerprints and they're updated very frequently. But when you look at the various players that are involved in your commercial transaction, those, those players are continuously collecting that information each time you need that. So um, I, I know there's a lot of work happening in that area, but as it progresses further, I think uh, the industry will see a lot more efficiency, and in that, customers will see a lot more convenience as compared to what it is right now. Thank, Thank you. you. I've been told my, our time is up. Do we have any time for a question? Yeah? Any question from the audience? Please go ahead. Can you please, do you mind using the mic so we can hear your question? Thank sure. You. In, in Europe and the US, like, there's, a, there's a trend where all the banks have APIs that integrate with apps and so forth. And there's, we noticed that within the UAE, for instance, there's only like maybe three banks or so that have APIs. Uh, so w we appreciate your perspective on how that can grow and what are the key barriers for that because that would also support the element of trust that we were discussing earlier and how that could be uh, an engine that could drive the growth of integrating banks for customer experiences through apps. Yeah, uh, so let me, let me give a quick one on that. And then yeah. just so I've just come back from Brussels where I've been advising on APIs uh, because, because they've got the PSD2 initiative out there and how do you, how do you resolve that issue? Uh, so every bank has to allow any, any third party payment provider access to the core account to initiate payments, or aggregate payments. Well. You, I mean, clearly you could do that writing just ordinary software, you know, one time, every link, but there are so many, there's so many banks and so many third parties that actually that's going to be really hard to do. And I think the smart money will be on open-based APIs because without that, the cost to, you know, the cost to the bank is just astronomic. And don't forget there, they have to do it by law by 2018. The only problem with that is... Um, Look, people say open APIs and APIs, and that's all very cool, um, but there's no substance behind that. So there are regulatory standards that are being built, but those, regula those regulatory standards, the RTSs, they actually tell you what you must do, not how you must do it. And I think, therefore, there's an opportunity um, to get in front of that by creating what the standards are, what the APIs are, and frankly, more to the point, what the service is that you want to actually get done. And I think that is both a huge opportunity for the banks and for the region. Because if the banks can get to a digital state, which I hope that they do, then they'll be able to navigate around whatever comes in the future, in my opinion. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Apparently, time is up. Thank you for joining us today. I really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.